Welcome to Physical Chemistry 2. I'm Michael Boydis and in this lecture we will revisit the kinetic theory of gases and we will relate some of the basic quantities such as pressure and temperature to internal energy. Let's jump in. So we'll start out with a recap uh, with, with what we have seen previously in Physical Chemistry 1 yeah, in Chemical Thermodynamics. Uh, and in the following, uh, we will develop a um, concrete, a more concrete thermodynamic model uh, of an ideal gas. And then we will use uh, this model as a basis for calculating some thermodynamic properties yeah, by applying laws known from uh, mechanics. Yeah. We will then um, define our model, yeah, firstly, uh, and try to obtain a relation between the motion of the particles and the gas pressure. Yeah? Uh, next, we will uh, find a correlation between the kinetic energy of the particles um, and the temperature. Yeah? And this correlation will then allow us to calculate molar heat capacities. Yeah? Uh, we will then learn about uh, the equal distribution theorem of energy and um, we will compare this uh, with experimental values, yeah, and uh, this will finally show us the limits of the applicability of our simple model. And uh, for the rest of the lecture, we will go beyond this simple model. Okay, so let's start out by defining our simple model of an ideal gas. Yeah, you've seen that before, so we'll go quickly through it. The gas consists of uh, individual particles, molecules or atoms. Um, the dimensions of the particles are minuscule compared to uh, the distance between each, uh, each other and compared to the dimensions of a vessel. Yeah, the particles do not exert any forces on each other except for collisions. Um, the particles are constantly in a completely disordered state, yeah, Brownian motion. Um, number five, the particles behave like rigid spheres. Uh, number six, for collisions of the particles with each other and with a wall, we apply conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. Yeah? And to, make, uh, to simplify some of the maths that we'll be going through, I will uh, include two further assumptions, yeah? number seven and eight. All particles have the same velocity, v, and we will see later in the course why this might not necessarily be a good assumption, yeah? um, but it will simplify the maths right now. And one third of all particles move in parallel to one of the principal axes, x, y, or z. Yeah? So that one's important. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's consider now our gas, yeah, as defined here on the left, in a cubic container. Yeah? Um, now the task is, what effect yeah, do these collisions of gas molecules have on um, that plane yeah, parallel to the, uh, on the wall parallel to the YZ plane? Yeah? So here, this, this wall here, with the area A. Yeah? So uh, let's first of all consider our assumption um, number eight. Yeah? Uh, we essentially say that one third of all our particles are moving along the x axis. Yeah? So this is one of our assumptions here, which is a fair assumption under this, uh, in the simple model. Uh, that means that only half of these particles are actually flying towards the surface A. Yeah? So let me just draw that in. So we said like one third is flying in each direction. Yeah? So it means flying into the direction of A is one half of one third of all particles. Yeah? So it means a total of one sixth fly towards the uh, surface A. Yeah? That means also yeah, that in a certain period of time here, um, let me just switch over to the laser pointer, in a certain period of time, dt, uh, 
Only those molecules will hit the wall, yeah, that are at most the distance uh, v dt away from the surface, yeah. So the, these are the particles here in this shaded cuboid that will actually manage to reach the surface A in a time dt. Okay, so uh, now let's consider um, the number of impacts during the time dt yeah, on A. So we will uh, uh, take 1n yeah, as the number density of gas particles yeah, and hence... Uh, the number of impacts during the time dt on the surface A is here given by equation 1.1. Yeah? So we've got one-sixth of uh, the whole number of, uh, of uh, uh, gas molecules hitting surface A with a mean velocity uh, v dash over the time dt. Yeah? Now let's quickly uh, sum up again what we know about uh, uh, mass and momentum yeah so we will simply now state each particle uh, sorry my this pen isn't very good each particle has a mass of little m yeah um, therefore before impact it has a momentum of mv and after impact yeah it has uh, a momentum of the same magnitude but opposite direction yeah also clear so therefore each particle transfers an um, an impulse of a magnitude 2 mv to the wall yeah during the impact yeah so it goes in with a momentum of mv, it comes out with a momentum uh, mv in the other direction, yeah, under our assumption number six, yeah. So uh, transferred impulse is 2mv yeah this is the transferred impulse to the wall all right and since the writing isn't very good with this pen i will probably stick with the uh with the uh, uh, printed equations from now okay so um this is essentially now the total momentum yeah dpx so the momentum uh, along the x-axis transferred to A yeah, during dt. Yeah? So this is 2 times yeah, 2 mv, 2 times 1 6 times 1 n times the surface area times the mean, mean velocity times mv here from this equation times dt. Yeah? So let's think about the force. Yeah, so uh, the derivative of uh, momentum with respect to time, yeah, dpx over dt will give us our force, yeah, equation 1.3. And if we divide the force um, by the area, yeah, we get our pressure, little p, yeah. So p is our f divided by a. Yeah. Hence, given our assumption here in point seven, yeah, and combining these two equations, we get for our pressure the expression one third times one n, yeah, one n our number density of gas particles times uh, m v squared, yeah, uh, is uh, is the description of pressure in our system. Right, so now let's use this relationship that we've derived for pressure and uh, go to molar quantities. Yeah, so let's plug in Avogadro's number, yeah, 6.022 uh, 6 times 10 to the power of 23, roughly, yeah, to get uh, um, uh, the number, number density of particles. 
and we will use uh, hence our molar volume yeah v mole so we get essentially the relationship uh, p times v mole equals one third of uh, na times mv squared yeah and this relationship should be quite clear now we also know that uh, one half of uh, mv squared is the kinetic energy yeah epsilon trans of a gas particle performing only translational uh, motion yeah so avogadro's number times epsilon trans is the molar kinetic energy of all gas particles all right so we get um, PV mole equals two thirds times NA times epsilon trans if we plug it in here. All right, now let's compare uh, this equation 1.7 to the ideal gas law. Yeah, so for the ideal gas law, you remember PV equals NRT, or in this case, yeah, since we already are in molar quantities, PV mole equals RT. Yeah. So we find a relationship between temperature of a gas yeah, here and the translational energy of gas particles when we look at these two equations. And this is given by uh, Avogadro's number yeah, times epsilon trans here. From, um, so Avogadro's number comes here from equation 1.6. Epsilon trans or kinetic energy comes from equation 1.7. Yeah, and if you just plug it in and substitute, you get then uh, um, Avogadro's number times the kinetic energy equals three halves, yeah, 1.5 times RT. Okay, so now let's divide all of this by Avogadro's number, yeah, to get to one particle only, and we will introduce the Boltzmann constant that you probably saw before, yeah, little k for R divided by Na. Yeah? So here in uh, equation 1.8, we essentially divide both sides by Na and we get epsilon trans out, yeah? which is our 1.5 R over Na times T yeah? equals uh, 1.5 Kt. Yeah? So here this is our uh, equation 1.9 and it links yeah, heat or temperature to some kind of particle motion. Yeah, and this has been observed as early back as uh, 1780 uh, or 90, I think. So uh, Robert Brown observed uh, in the early microscopes that you know pollen or dust grains move around in a drop of water. Yeah, with, uh, what he described irregular jerky movements. Yeah, and this was later def uh, described as Brownian motion. So um, let's try now to calculate on the basis of equation 1.8 the molar heat capacity of a, of a gas. Yeah. So we realize um, hopefully that a monoatomic gas, so a gas consisting of just one atom, yeah, can have no vibrational energy. Yeah. Since a vibrating particle would have to consist of at least two atoms yeah, between uh, which forces can act. Yeah? Also, we find um, that an ideal monoatomic gas has no rotational energy. Yeah? And this is, uh, this is usually calculated using quantum mechanics, and we might come back to this in the later parts of the course. Uh, but it's already clear from classical physics yeah, that uh, rotational energy becomes zero um, if a center of mass lies on the principal axis of rotation. Yeah? So if you spin a particle um, around X or Y or Z and there is no other, uh, and the center of mass lies exactly at zero, yeah, your rotational energy will also be zero. Yeah? Uh, so that means uh, if a center of mass lies on the principal axis of rotation, yeah, the moment of inertia becomes zero. So um, an ideal uh, monoatomic gas yeah, can therefore have only translational energy. Yeah? And uh, this, uh, this is given here yeah, in 
equation 1.9 that this translational energy epsilon trans can be equated with uh, the molar internal energy yeah, of an ideal monoatomic gas. And we get U, yeah, the internal energy of monoatomic gas is, equals, is equal to 3 half RT. Um, so now if we differentiate this expression, yeah, 1.9 by T yeah, at constant volume, we, are, we obtain the molar heat capacity, C, at constant volume of the ideal monatomic gas. And this is given here in equation 110. Yeah? And according to equation 110, yeah, this is again Cv equals du dt by dt yeah? at constant, uh, uh, at constant um, volume, we get 3 half R. Yeah? So according to equation 110, uh, the molar heat capacity of the ideal monoatomic gas um, should be independent of the chemical nature of this gas and independent of temperature. Yeah? So we have got no information here about vibrating bonds or any other composition and we also don't have any um, T here yeah, left in this equation. So a value um, of 1.5 R or 3 half R calculated with the help of this kinetic theory of gases agrees broadly yeah, with the values uh, determined experimentally yeah, for the noble gases. Um, so uh, for the noble gases down here yeah, um, uh, and also for monoatomic mercury. Yeah, you see that here um, at low pressures and sufficiently high temperatures. Yeah? So low pressures, yeah, again think of the definitions of the ideal gas which we extrapolated on slide 3 I think. Yeah? So large distances between the gases, no interaction between the gases yeah? and sufficiently high temperature so that there is sufficient motion yeah? and that gases don't uh, start to condense. Yeah? So this result, yeah, this, this agreement here for this monoatomic gases um, should encourage us yeah, with uh, the transfer of the findings of classical mechanics yeah, to the molecular realm still leads to correct results yeah, when we drop this assum uh, assumption of monoatomic gases and when we start considering um, polyatomic gases. Yeah, because I mean, like, you obviously see here these uh, polyatomic uh, or diatomic gases, uh, they start behaving differently. Yeah, um, because in addition to translation, yeah, polyatomic gases should be able to perform rotations yeah, and vibrations. Yeah, so that, uh, that the internal energy yeah, should contain some sort of uh, term to, to accommodate rotation and oscillation. So now if uh, we want to state the magnitudes uh, yeah, of the rotational vibrational components um, um, of the total energy of the gas molecules, yeah, we have to refer to the classical equidistribution theorem uh, of energy, yeah, uh, which we'll be deriving later. So, uh, this uh, law of equal distribution of energy states that when we are at thermal equilibrium, yeah, um, we get an equal contribution in energy for every orthogonal or independent degree of freedom. Yeah? So it means every degree, and it also states every degree of freedom contributes quadratically towards the energy of a molecule. Now let's see that in action for um, translational energy. Yeah? So we essentially get here for our epsilon trans, our translational energy, uh, 1 half mvx squared plus 1 half mvy squared plus 1 half mvz squared. Yeah? Remember from the previous slides where we uh, derived epsilon trans total, yeah? this was 3 halves mv squared. Yeah? And uh, again, according to the law of equal distribution of energies, um, we get an equal uh, co uh, component at each of the um, 
independent orthogonal uh, degrees of freedom, yeah, which contributes quadratically, yeah, hence one half mv squared in x, y, and z, yeah, and like this, we can also get the x and y or z terms of a rotational energy, yeah, so here epsilon rotational is one half i x omega x squared plus one half i y omega y squared plus one half i z omega z squared. Yeah, now what are i and omega? Consider, I mean, remember we're talking about rotational energies here. So i, uh, x, y, z uh, will be our moments of inertia. Yeah. And omega is our angular velocity. Yeah. Now let's consider um, vibrations. Yeah. So uh, this will be the case for stretched or even angled polyatomic molecules. Yeah. If we now, uh, let's assume the special case that we situate, uh, let's say, a diatomic molecule along the x-axis. Yeah. Um, so, uh, here, here we must take uh, um, into account that each of these oscillations or vibrations has two quadratic degrees of freedom. Yeah, so we can see that here. Uh, again, let me just bring up the laser pointer. So these are the two quadratic terms uh, in vibra um, for epsilon vibrational. Yeah, we've got one half mu x along the x-axis, vx squared uh, plus one half dx squared. Yeah, so here, since we're talking about vibrations, mu x is our... Um, reduced mass of uh, of a molecule yeah and in the case that we really position that along the x-axis this would be also equal to the actual mass uh, and d is our directional constant And x um, would be the deflection from from the resting point. Okay, so don't worry too much about the, uh, the equations right now. Just remember that we have seen them and we will circle back to them as they become applicable. Okay, now suppose uh, we increase the molar, uh, molar translational energy now by an amount uh, equals to 1.5 RT. Yeah, so since the uh, kinetic energy has three degrees of freedom, yeah, compare with 1.11. Uh, we, attribu we attribute essentially 0 0.5 RT uh, uh, to each of uh, these degrees of freedom or in terms of molar cap heat capacity we would attribute uh, 0 0.55 R yeah, to each of these degrees of freedom. Yeah? Remember um, the total translational energy is 3 half mv squared yeah? so if we increase this by 3 half RT this gets redistributed and accordingly molar heat capacity along x, y, and z will then also increase by 3 half divided by 3 yeah, by a total of 0 0.5 RT. Uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, in the case of molar capacity, the contribution would be 0 0.5 R to each one degree of freedom. Yeah? And according to the law 
of equal distribution of energy. Yeah, these uh, amounts, which we quoted here, should also apply to the degrees of freedom of rotation and oscillation, of course. And we look at that on the following slides. Okay, at this point, uh, we first need to consider how to determine the number of degrees of freedom for each type of motion in polyatomic molecules. And the polyatomic molecules which we'll be looking at are shown here in this figure. In principle, uh, they are either diatomics yeah, or uh, uh, triatomics that are stretched. So you can, here in this depicted case, you essentially have a diatomic, which is uh, immediately linear, but you can also imagine yeah, that we have another atom sitting here along the x-axis and for whatever reason it cannot bend out of shape. Yeah, For example, if you consider HCN, this is the case. Um, so in this case, uh, uh, we would have the uh, case of number of atoms free yeah, and a stretched or linear arrangement. Yeah, and the other type which we'll be considering are these angled polyatomic molecules. Yeah, Water is a good example. Uh, but now let's look at the ge more general case. Yeah? In an anatomic molecule, each atom has uh, three degrees of freedom of motion. Yeah? Hence, the total number of degrees of freedom is 3n. Yeah? If we now consider um, translation of a molecule, yeah, we can essentially describe it uh, by the translation of its center of gravity, yeah? for which we must take three degrees of freedom. Yeah? And this leaves us with a total of 3n minus 3 degrees of freedom for rotation and vibration. Yeah, uh, so we can describe, as we just saw, yeah, the, the uh, rotational motion, yeah, by the rotation of the entire molecule around its center of gravity. Yeah, now if we consider the figure for a, a triatomic stretched or for a diatomic linear molecule. Yeah, um, we can choose the molecular axis yeah, as one of these principal rotational axes. In this case, we would choose the x-axis as the rotational axis. Yeah, the other two axes of rotation are then perpendicular yeah, to the molecular axis uh, um, and the center of gravity. Yeah, so the center of gravity is lying here at this intersection. Yeah, so this in, in, the, in the depicted case. The moment of inertia yeah, for rotation about the x-axis uh, would be vanishingly small. Yeah? And we've seen previously in equation 1.12, I think, yeah, how to calculate uh, epsilon rod, yeah, so the rotational energy. And in the case of a uh, triatomic stretch molecule of a, of a diatomic, uh, you would then only um, uh, calculate uh, the total rotational energy about the axis perpendicular yeah, to this molecular axis. Yeah, so in summary, each stretched molecule has only two degrees of freedom of rotation. Yeah? The situation is then of course different uh, for an angled molecule. Yeah? Here we need to consider rotation around three perpendicular axes, yeah? hence we need three degrees of freedom for rotation. For the um, vibrational motion, yeah, uh, we get for diatomics essentially 3n minus 5 degrees of freedom, yeah? the same for stretch molecules, yeah? so in the case of 3n minus 5 with n equals 2, yeah, so 3n minus 5, 3 times 2 minus 5, we get one vibrational degree of freedom, or in the case of uh, the triatomic stretched, yeah, 3n minus 5, 3 times 3 equals 9, minus 5 equals 4 vibrational degrees of freedom, yeah. And for the angled polyatomic, yeah, we essentially get 3n minus 6. Yeah, so in the case of a triatomic, 3 times 3 minus 6 is our uh, 3. So let me just jot that in. So essentially here for the diatomic and for the stretched, we would get a total of 3n 
minus 5 yeah and for uh, uh, triatomic angled or anatomic angled yeah we essentially have 3n oh sorry this didn't work out 3n minus 6 and in this case yeah here we have yeah well n equals 2 or n equals 3 and in the lower case n equals 3 all right so um and according to equation 113 yeah for vibrational uh, energies we assign um to each of these uh, uh two quadratic degrees of freedom yeah to each of these vibrations uh so the degrees of freedom yeah the total number of the deg degrees of freedom and um uh molar heat capacities yeah, cv are listed here yeah so we can sort of see um cv is uh, according to our calculation half of the total number of quadratic degrees of freedom yeah so in the case of three total uh, degrees of freedom we get um, a molar uh, heat capacity of uh, um, 1.5 r yeah in the case of seven quadratic degrees of freedom we get 3.5 r yeah uh, here for uh, triatomic stretched we have 6.5 r triatomic angled 6.0 r yeah since we are short one degree of freedom and for the generic case of an anatomic angle so we've get we get 6 n minus 6 yeah divide all that by 2 we get 3 n minus 3 r um, as the molar heat capacity. So now let's compare the previous table with some experimentally achieved uh, values for molar heat capacities. Yeah, so in the case of our monoatomic noble gases or in the case of monoatomic mercury vapors, yeah, as expected we have our CV values of around one point of uh, exactly 1.5 R. Yeah, but already with the most simple diatomics, we find that, this, that there is some sort of limit yeah, at about 3.5 R that is reached uh, only at very high temperatures. Yeah? Um, so let's consider the case of uh, hydrogen. Yeah? And here we find that at temperatures below 50 Kelvin, yeah, our CV is exactly equal to 1.5 R. Yeah, and then between room temperature and about 600, yeah, we reach a CV value of approximately 2.5 R. Yeah, and then above 1,000, so roughly here, we see a further and quite significant increase of uh, molar heat capacity. Yeah, uh, for nitrogen and oxygen, yeah, we see a CV value of around 2.5. Uh, up to about 400k yeah so up to about here this is for oxygen and nitrogen yeah and uh, then we start approaching a limit yeah just of around 3r at around 2000 kelvin yeah and it is striking yeah that these curves the plots of cv versus temperature show these two pronounced plateaus yeah just at the values of 1.5 r here at the bottom and 2.5 r here at the top yeah so now from our calculations we of course know what these plateaus um, uh, correspond to yeah so 1.5 r is uh, corresponds to uh, the translational contribution yeah of a molar heat capacities so here we have our 1.5 r which is the translational oops translational contribution and 2.5 r would be our rotational contribution to molar heat capacities yeah So we also find something else from this plot, yeah, namely that at low temperatures, yeah, and intermediate temperatures, uh, the translational, rotational, and vibrational motions are not 
independent of each other. And this is contrary, of course, when to the uh, theorem of the equal distribution of energies. Yeah. So at these temperatures, at the lower and intermediate temperatures, uh, um, we find that the chemical nature of the gases plays a role. So here we are essentially violating our proposal of the ideal gas formulated in the first slide. Yeah, this, these are the limits for a simplified model. Yeah, at low temperatures, the molecules start interacting with one another. Yeah. So at very low temperatures, yeah, here 50K and below, we see the diatomic hydrogen yeah, has only a heat capacity of 1.5 R, hence it can only perform translational movements. Yeah. And the vibrational movements, yeah, this will be above uh, 2.5 R, only start to matter at temperatures above 1000. Yeah, so here, this is the translational regime for hydrogen. Here we approach this rotational plateau and 1000 and above, we start addressing the vibrational modes as well. Yeah, chlorine on the other hand, yeah, so you see it here, yeah. This is um, uh, exhibits rotational movement at lower temperatures, yeah, and the this oscillation, <coughs> excuse me, oscillation and vibration is already fully excited and fully accessible at around 600 Kelvin. Yeah, so here we have reached a 3.5 R limit. So on the last slide, we have seen the limitation of a simple. Uh, monoatomic uh, ideal gas model. In the next lecture we will be looking um, with uh, Boltzmann statistics at the distribution of molecular energies and molecular speed. Yeah? And um, I recommend for the content of this lecture that you refer to Atkins physical chemistry, yeah, in particular chapter 1, and the principles of physics, yeah, in particular chapter 19. See you next time.